Uh, Lord, again, we ask as we come uh, to your word, this uh, Psalm 46, that you would bless uh, it, that you would bless us through our understanding of it better, and that most of all, we would see you, indeed, as our refuge and our strength, as the one who gives us confidence and comfort. The Lord, speak, but your servants are listening. Amen. All right, I want to tell you some about uh, a mighty fortress is our God. As our president and uh, many of our national leaders and other foreign leaders uh, gathered together uh, in the National Cathedral on September 14th in 2001, just three days after uh, September 11th, the words of this hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, resounded throughout that beautiful worship space in our nation's capital. That same song has been sung all over the world. Uh, it was famously sung in the Battle of Leipzig by, uh, by soldiers in 1631. It's been sung all over the world, um, every nation. Every tongue, it seems, that has a written word that knows Jesus sings the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Um, it's known that there are at least 70 English translations of this hymn. Isn't that amazing? 70 English translations of this hymn. The one that we sing uh, goes back to, uh, to 1853. It was translated by Frederick Hedge, who was a, a minister here in the United States. I mean, and so we know it as a mighty fortress is our God. But it goes all the way back to the early 16th century. And it was written by the great Protestant reformer Martin Luther. I will say this. I, wasn't gonna, I don't have this in my notes at all. But uh, he also wrote the tune. And I was mentioning this to the musicians beforehand that what the reformers did is they didn't just write uh, words. They didn't just translate the words of old songs, typically in Latin, into the vernacular, as they did with the Bible also. But they also wrote tunes. And typically what they did is they actually took little uh, bar jaunties and actually sort of made them uh, work in the context of the church. So you can picture, if you know much about Martin Luther, huge German beer steins singing A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And, but he wrote the tune also, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Ein Festeberg is the name of the tune. Um, this hymn is most often sung throughout the world on the Sunday that falls closest to Halloween, because that's also known as Reformation Day. Um, Protestants typically celebrate the Protestant Reformation around October 31st. But interestingly, now it's actually one of the recommended hymns in the Catholic Mass in the English tradition. And it actually made its way first into a Catholic uh, hymnal in 1972 in one of the Catholic, uh, Canadian Catholic hymnals. Um, so one historian of hymns wrote this about this hymn. He was writing in the um, 1800s. He says, it was the Marseillaise of the Reformation. Some of you know the, the French uh, national anthem, the Marseillaise. It was the anthem of the French Revolution, which talks about spilling the blood of your enemies to water the fields of France. This hymn doesn't do that, but anyway, this is helpful. It was the Marseillaise of the Reformation. It was sung at Augsburg during the Diet and in all the churches of Saxony. That was the region where Martin Luther lived. Often against the protest of the priests. It was sung in the streets and so heard, comforted the hearts of Melanchthon, Jonas, and Cruziger, those are friends of Luther, as they entered Weimar when banished from Wittenberg in 1547. It was sung by poor Protestant immigrants on their way into exile and by martyrs at their death. It is woven into the web of the history of Reformation times and it became the true national hymn of Protestant Germany. This hymn, you might know, has a, has a nickname. Not a lot of hymns get nicknames. This hymn gets a nickname. Its nickname is the Battle Hymn of the Reformation, uh, strengthening the hearts and the resolve of those who were defending the gospel of grace alone through Christ's work alone. The church had distorted the gospel in many ways in sort of late medieval times, particularly uh, what's most commonly known as the indulgences was a way of distorting the gospel. Indulgence was a way of paying primarily, particularly, for, those to, uh, for loved ones to be released from purgatory. 
Um, some of you might know the name, if you know Protestant uh, Reformation history, of Johann Tetzel. Johann Tetzel uh, was known, and not just for, not just uh, you know, locally, but really broadly, he was known as a, a master marketer. Um, he w- had a nickname, the Pope's Salesman. So he was a marketing genius, and he would enter a town. They had these big coffins um, that were uh, covered with brass and carried in. But sometimes he would actually enter a town with trumpets blaring and with sort of fanfare. And he had his own little jaunty tunes that he would sing as he would go into a town. Um, And he would also cry out phrases like this, Don't let your dear mother stay in purgatory any longer. How about that for like guilt tripping, giving some money to build a new building down in Rome? Um, but he, would, he, he, had, he had little tunes, and at least one of the tunes that we know of uh, had words like this. Each time a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And so the Protestant reformers, and this is actually helpful that you understand this, they understood, just like Johann Tetzel understood this, the power of music, the power of singing and songs and psalms, And so um, these teachings and sort of combating this idea of buying and earning God's favor um, moved in the hearts of people like Martin Luther for the need to reform the church, to call the church back to the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel of grace. Um, So when you think of the Protestant Reformation, I think what you tend to think of is preaching or is simply saying, oh, the Catholics are doing this, let's do this. But what I want you to sort of get to is that this was a reformation of music and of song and of going back to the Psalms and finding their comfort in God's word there. So this famous hymn was written by Luther, and he also composed the tune. This is his most famous one, The Mighty Fortress is Our God. And people aren't really sure when he wrote it. There's actually uh, seven different theories about what date Martin Luther wrote this. The, uh, the best theory, it seems, is around 1527. If you know sort of some of this history, you'll know that in, in 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door there in Wittenberg in Germany. So about 10 years after that. But this part was the darkest part that we know of of Luther's life, the darkest part of his life. Um, a dear friend was martyred early on that year. One of his closest friends was killed for the faith. In the fall of that year, in 1527, in the fall, there was a plague that went through Wittenberg, and it killed many who lived there. Um, In December of that year, in 1527, Martin Luther wrote to a friend. By the way, he refers to himself as Luther in this writing. It's kind of funny. Um, We are all in good health except for Luther himself. I don't know why he didn't say except for me, but that's what he wrote. Okay who is physically well, but outwardly the whole world and inwardly the devil and his angels are making him suffer. In January of 1528, Luther wrote a friend saying that he had experienced the worst temptations and trials of his life. So it's into this context that Luther goes to the 46th Psalm and he meditates on it. And he meditates on it, and he begins to write this famous, famous hymn. It's in the midst of these times, and going forward into similar experiences, that it's known that he would actually say to his good friend, Philip Melanchthon, who sort of uh, was his successor in the German Reformation, Lutheran Reformation, he would say to Philip, Philip, let's sing the 46th. That's what he would say. Philip, let's sing the 46th. In the midst of the trials and the temptations of this life, in the midst of the chaos of his life, he would go back to the 46th Psalm. It became known as the Battle Hymn of the Reformation, but when it was published first that we know of in 1529 in Augsburg, which is where a lot of the publishing happened for Luther, he gave it a subtitle. And the subtitle of his hymn was a hymn of comfort. Isn't that kind of interesting? That there's this connection between comfort and confidence. I mean, it's a battle hymn. A mighty fortress is our God. It seems very confident. But he says it's a hymn of comfort. A mighty fortress is our God. And the 46th Psalm, which it's based on, here's what I want to say, is a hymn of confidence in God. 
and therefore comfort for the Christian. Okay? Those two things are totally, totally connected throughout Scripture, but here, clearly, in Psalm 46. There's a confidence in who God is, and therefore there's a comfort for those who follow him. Okay, so how so? We'll look at verse 1. Verse 1, it says this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Two things that it says first about God, and this is what the whole rest of the psalm is based on. God is refuge and God is strength. God is refuge. He's a stronghold. Uh, think of a great castle, right? A great place where you can go to and you can be comforted by what's happening out there. You can be secure. You can be safe inside the walls of that great stronghold. I think of Peter. Last week I mentioned this, but Peter saying in John, Jesus, to whom else should we go? You alone have the words of life. It's as though here the psalmist is saying, God, to whom else should we go? Because you're the great refuge. You're the place of strength. You're the one who has walls that are impenetrable. With you, there is absolute safety where, you, where we cannot find it anywhere else. God alone is our refuge. Where else should we go but to you, Lord? When the world is overwhelming, when it seems as though everything is out to get us, you alone are a refuge. It says more than this, right? Because it says, God, you, you, uh, you are the, uh, my refuge and my strength, which is an interesting thing. So what a lot of commentators agree is that these words, uh, the first idea of God as refuge is primarily that he gives rest, uh, that he gives uh, protection, that he's that place where you can go to in the midst of the crazy trials of life. And so he go, you can go for refuge, but also you can go out into the world with all of its chaos, outside maybe of the walls of the castle, because he's also your strength. When the world seems fraught with cha- challenges, with the enemy, with plagues, and with pestilence, you can actually go into that, because God is your strength. Bold confidence, bold confidence, because God is refuge and he is strength. There's a confidence in God here. If you consider what we read aloud together, this refrain that you sometimes find, it's like choruses that we sing in our singing together. There's a, there's a, uh, a refrain that you all said with me, and it says this, verse 7 and then verse 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Right? 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. It's that Hebraic way of writing something and then flipping it, right? God is our refuge and our strength. Here it says he's with us and he's our fortress. You can go out in strength and confidence because he's with you. You can also retreat to him in safety because he is your fortress and he is your refuge. He is our strength as we go out into the world to face the long sleepless nights of anxiety as we face doctors who give uh, dire diagnoses, um, something that's very real in my life, the Lord is with us as we parent, which as talking to some of you even this week, it never stops. You can eat parenting as they grow older in different ways. The Lord is with us as we engage in friendships, as we develop new friendships. The Lord is with us in our work, in the life In this world, it seems so often upside down. Let me go back to this. This psalm is a hymn of confidence and of comfort. It's a confidence of who God is, a refuge and a strength, a fortress who is with us. And because of that, it's a comfort to those who follow him. It's a comfort for Christians. So the psalm moves after this bold declaration, right? God is our refuge and our strength. And it doesn't, and this is what I love about the Bible. This is one of the reasons why I think the Bible is so incredibly compelling. The Bible never glosses over the challenges and the difficulties of life. Because it's so easy maybe to just sing a, a jaunty tune and to seem as though it's, you know, the, the famous opium of the masses. So, like, oh, God's our refuge and our strength. 
And so we don't have to actually deal with how difficult the world is. But this psalm moves from that statement and it goes right into this picture that is utterly overwhelming. Utterly overwhelming. So here's verse 2 and verse 3. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. See this flow uh, coming together of the mountains and the sea. And what we have here in, this, in these verses, in some ways, is, it's a little glimpse. I got this uh, idea from uh, James Boyce. Some of you know who that is. He was the, a, a famous pastor and preacher over at 10th in Philly. Uh, what he suggests is that this is a, uh, you, we, a small reversal of creation, particularly of the third day of creation. Uh, there in Genesis chapter 1, Um, God speaks on the third day, and when he speaks, there is the sea being put in its place and the dry land, the mountains, being put in their place. And after that happens, after each day of creation, God says, this is good. This is how I intend the world to be. And what do we have here, right? Uh, Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, uh, the, the mountains will be moved into the heart of the sea. Uh, the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. It's a reversal of God's good intent for creation. The earth giving way, the mountains being moved into the heart of the sea. And what does he say happens in this? Fear. Right? That's a fearful situation. Um, some of you know that this, there's, there's, some of this is happening right now in our world. This great flooding that happened in Germany, actually, just this last week. Um, in our own house this last week. I will tell you this, uh, Sunday night, um, this crazy amount of rain came through, right? Supposedly about three inches in this area in two hours. Um, I stayed up uh, till nearly midnight emptying bowls of water that were coming into our living room from outside. We had a huge leak. Um, Stayed up Monday night doing the same thing. It is a fearful situation when you've got water coming where you don't want it. Right? That's totally fear-inducing. This produces fear. But I think also what's happening here, because it's it's a reversal of creation, it's actually inviting us to see all the other ways that this happens. What what is fear-inducing for you? How how is sort of creation being reversed inducing fear for you? Um, Maybe infertility, just persisting. Um, chronic pain that is just ever present in your body, a mind and a heart that seem to not work, mental illness that plagues you, a terminal diagnosis, a family conflict that just does not seem like it's re- resolved. It can't be resolved. These ways in which the world and God's good intent for the world have been flip-flopped, and it creates it, it in. Uh, it creates within us all kinds of fear. It's in the midst of this. He says, God's your strength. He's your refuge. And it's because of this deep confidence in God that there is an absolute comfort for the Christian. The wild thing in, in verse 2 is not these, this, just this image of creation reversal, but the statement, therefore we will not fear. In that situation, in the situations I list, how do you not fear? How do you not fear? But that you have great confidence in who God is and who he is for you, a fortress, a refuge, your strength. Some of you are familiar with the name, the writer, the speaker, the missionary Elizabeth Elliot. I hope you've read some of her works. She was really an amazing woman, um, you might know this. Uh, her first husband died he, as, a, as a missionary. They were missionaries down in Ecuador. And he was killed by the very people they were going to proclaim the gospel to. Um, she actually went back later and, and was a missionary there for a couple years. And many of them came to saving faith in Jesus. What you might not know is that her second husband also died of cancer. He was a well-known doctor. Uh, he did great things. He died 42 years, 42 years before she died. She well outlived both of her husbands. Uh, She says this in those times with experiences like those. 
Everything that seemed most dependable has given way. Mountains are falling. Earth is reeling. In such a time, it is a profound comfort to know that although all things seem to be shaken, one thing is not. God is not shaken. I mean, here's a woman who lives such a life of faithfulness to Jesus. Here's uh, the sons of Korah. This isn't written by, by um, David. Here's Martin Luther, this great uh, leader of the Protestant Reformation. None of them glossed over how the world seems to be totally messed up at times. None of them said, ah, everything's just totally fine. She says, everything seems to be reeling. Everything seems to be shaken. And yet they have a comfort and a confidence because of what she said. Because when all of the world is shaking, one thing's not shaking. God is not shaking. He's a refuge and a strength, a very present help in trouble. God is our confidence. Therefore, there is comfort for Christians. So this is the great theme of this psalm, Psalm 46. Confidence and comfort. God is refuge and strength and fortress. But there's something interesting in how this psalm develops. I'm not going to go into this as much, but I want you to see this. Um, If you do have this, keep this open, okay? One of the things that it seems to do here is that it seems to look forward first in the second stanza there, And then it seems to look back, okay? Let me read the second stanza again for us. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. One of the things that Christian commentators grab onto here is the image of the book of Revelation. There you have the nations coming before the Lord. There you have the river of life. And there you have a sea. Think about this too. It's not the sea of chaos of creation. It's not the sea that upheaves, uh, 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 throws mountains over here in Psalm 46. But it's a sea of crystal. It's calm. There where God is, there where God will be, the nations will bow down before him and all will be made right. That's the image that we have in the book of Revelation. An absolute confidence in what God will do. This raging water will one day be stilled at his voice. The nations that battle against him will one day come and what Revelation tells us is actually they will bring their glory into his throne room. So there's a forward-looking reality here in the confidence of God and him being their strength and their fortress. But there's also something where he sort of looks back. Let me read the next uh, paragraph here, the next stanza. It says this, Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he's brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I'm God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. It's kind of a, it struck me when we were singing, not not just now, but sort of earlier also, when we were singing this Psalm 46, verse 3, and the three verses are uh, mirror these three stanzas. There it says, Come, let us see what the Lord has done. The ruins he brings to the earth. I wonder if you, when you first sing that, you're like, we want to see something ruined? God will ruin something? Or here, the beginning of verse 8, come, behold the works of the Lord, how he brings desolations, how he's brought desolations on the earth. I, well, first, I just kind of went, I don't, what? But look at how it moves. What is it that he's destroying here? He makes war cease. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots. He's taking all of that which battles against his, his perfect plan for creation. 
often people refer to this as, as uh, uh, Satan, the, the world, sin, and the devil. Everything that battles against our Lord, he says he's going to bring to desolation. But here, interestingly enough, it says um, how he has brought this to pass. I want to suggest to you, if, if you are in Christ, you have a way of singing this psalm that, that the Old Testament people had no clue yet of. They hoped to be able to sing it this way, but you, knowing who Jesus was, can sing it more fully. And that's actually why, by the way, when you read A Mighty Fortress is Our God in Psalm 46, it doesn't always connect. Because part of what Martin Luther is doing is saying, this happens in Christ. This happens in Jesus. Why can you have confidence in God? Because Jesus can go to the cross. He can take on the sin of the world. He can take on the powers of Rome. All of that. And bring it to nothing. He brings desolation to that. He takes on the, the places of great power. The chariots, right? The nations of the earth. Rome itself. Jesus says, your power is nothing against mine. I will bring, or I will be the great fortress and the great refuge and the great strength of my people. And nothing will be able to shake that. Nothing will be able to shake that. I will bring my purposes to bear on earth perfectly. The desolations that I will bring will be for war and for sin and for the, the wiles of the devil. This is what we celebrate in Jesus this is what we celebrate in Christ. Colossians says it this way, For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things, to, uh, to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Brothers and sisters, Psalm 46. A mighty fortress is your God. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though all around you seems just utterly chaotic, Though you lose spouse after spouse, God is your refuge. He's your strength. He is your ever-present help in your trouble. As Elizabeth Elliot said, let me end with this thought. Well, man, now I can't find it. I'll paraphrase it. I don't know why I can't find it. The world may seem like everything is being shaken, shaken up, tossed around. God is not. He is not. He is your confidence, and because he is your confidence, he can also be your comfort. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, uh, we're thankful for these words from Psalm 46, and we are very thankful, Lord, for Martin Luther putting that, them into that beautiful hymn, A Mighty Fortress is our God and pointing us to the Lord Jesus who can take on all things, the weight of sin, the powerful of the world are nothing before you. Death itself is put to death in the resurrection. Lord Jesus, we pray. We pray that these great truths would be our great comfort and our joy, that we would rest in knowing great God that you are our strength, that you are our refuge, and that you are our fortress. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.